everyone. Um, now we are going to move on to talking about how um, causal stories really apply to specific policy issues. And we're going to do that by looking at the case of in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants. But before we get started, I thought that we might have a little bit of levity. So it occurred to me that as I am um, talking into the microphone, recording these lectures, that you might be hearing a little bit of uh, noise in the background coming from um, these two lovely creatures. So these are my dogs. Um, the yellow one is named Thera, and um, the other one is named Dexter, and they can be a little bit loud. So I apologize if that ever uh, interferes with the lecture. Um, if it does, please let me know and um, that, that it's really becoming a problem. Hopefully it shouldn't. They don't, you know, I don't think that you can hear it too much. But anyway, I thought you might uh, want to know what was creating all the noise. So they look innocent, but they're really noisy. Um, so today, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about immigration. And so by the end of today, um, or so here's how it's going to go. We're going to review the problem definition and causal stories very briefly. Then we're going to talk about the background of state immigration policy. You're going to watch a couple of very brief videos on in-state tuition, these two different causal stories. Um, and then we're going to talk very briefly about the reading. And I'm going to give you some questions to think about that might help you to begin to make these connections. Now, um, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk only very briefly about the reading because I really want you to do it. Um, and I want you to begin to be making these connections yourself. And so I'm going to talk about them in, in sort of broad strokes. But um, I think the, that the reading is a particularly strong example of this causal story and pretty obvious. Um, however, I maybe shouldn't say that it's obvious because if you don't have experience with these topics, they can not, they're not always very clear. And so if you are feeling confused in any way or you're not quite catching it, um, please, please, please email me or let's set up some office hours to talk about it. Um, okay. So as a reminder, these after today, you should be able to slides are your um, study guide for the tests, for the assessments. And so if you can do all of the things on these lists, you are absolutely prepared to take the test. Um, and so by the end of today, you should be able to reinforce your understanding of causal stories and problem definition, be able to recognize a causal story and policy coverage, understand how a causal story or problem definition can change the possible policy outcomes, and apply the concept of problem definition and causal stories through analysis of a variety of policy issues. So just as a quick reminder, on in the last lecture, we talked about this, this concept, um, a theoretical concept of a causal story. And we looked at the case of smoking um, to illustrate how different causal stories appear in a variety of, of media settings and, and policy coverage. And the essence of a causal story is um, it is a politicized explanation of why a problem exists who and who is to blame, right? And in, in figuring out who is to blame, we also establish who is responsible for fixing the problem. And in addition to doing that, um, the causal story also provides some sort of legitimation for government intervention, right? So these are the very key concepts of a causal story. Um, in the case of smoking, so we have these two different causal stories, one that puts a blame on the individual and the other that puts a blame on corporations. And the policies that come out of this we saw are different, right? With the ones that put the blame on the individual targeting individual behavior, and the ones that put the blame on the corporation targeting corporate behavior. Um, and so we see that this is a really, really important concept in understanding public policy generally, and then in understanding how we might go about analyzing policy. Because the first step is figuring out what is the definition of the problem? What is it that we're talking about? What's driving it? Who's to blame? Who should be compensated for it? Who should pay for that compensation, et cetera? All right. So the, fir the first thing that we're going to do in figuring out how causal stories relate to in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants is talk about immigration as a state and local issue. 
And so what is it that I mean by this? What is state immigration policy? And so, I mean, quite basically, this is policy developed by state governments that's directed at immigrants, um, but it typically doesn't legislate on immigration directly. And that's because of something that we call federal preemption. And what this means is that um, the courts have consistently found that the Constitution puts the actual regulation of immigration in the hands of the federal court of the federal government. All right. And that means then that the states don't have the authority to, for example, say, yes, you can come into this country or no, you cannot come into this country. So in the most basic way, um, the states don't have authority over immigration. But what they do have authority over are things like driver's licenses, access to welfare and social services, education, policing, etc. And so even though they can't decide whether an immigrant can enter the country, they can dictate how that immigrant is um, treated and the types of services that they have access to once they arrive. And so this, this is the area where a lot of states have created legislation, states and localities for that matter. And so this can have both positive and negative effects for immigrants. We'll talk about those positive and negative effects um, in a little bit, but um, for example, we have some cities who make legislation that create amnesty areas or um, they, they say basically that their city will not enforce or cooperate with the enforcement of national or federal um, immigration policy, right? So the, they say, well, our police, for example, are not going to um, enforce we're not going to participate in deportation exercises or something like this, right? So this can have a positive effect on immigrants. There are other, other examples as well. Um, but we also see really negative pol policy, um, such as what was passed in, in Arizona requiring um, immigrants to carry documentation at all times and allowing the police to ask for that documentation, right? So that was actually struck down as unconstitutional uh, because of the, the negative impacts it has not only on the immigrant population, but on the larger Latino population. And so we see sort of there are two sides to these sorts of policies. Um, but the, but the I guess, overarching question becomes why states and localities legislate on these topics. If there is federal preemption, if the states understand that they're not supposed to be legislating, why are they doing this? And the answer... Um, is a complicated one. So from the nation's founding, states and localities have had both formal and informal policies regarding immigrants. Um, and so part of this has depended on whether or not immigrants are viewed as a threat or a help. And this has depended a lot on where you live. And so in the Northeast, for example, when we, in, in our early stages of immigration, we had, um, Many immigrants, we had, well, let's back up. In cities, we had political machines that were, uh, had the goal of sort of concentrating political power in their own hands. And that we also had large immigrant populations. And the immigrants became an, a foundational part of securing power in the hands of the machines. And so immigrants tended to be treated pretty well because they were part of, um, they were part of the political machine's power. In contrast, in the Southwest, there has long been a confrontational relationship between communities and immigrants. Um, and so even though um, the South farmers and businessmen in the Southwest have relied on immigrant employees, temporary immigrant employees, for example, um, farmhands, for as long as we've been a country, there was a real tension about whether or not those individuals should stay in the country the services that should be provided for them. And so there were often incentives to try and make them leave the country after they had fulfilled limited employment duties. Um, but despite this historic legacy, the number of formal policies uh, that, that at the state and local level that deal with immigration have increased tremendously over the last 20 years. Um, and so in 2007 alone, over 1,500 pieces of legislation were introduced at the state level. And in that same time period, 135 local governments introduced legislation. And so the question is why? Why is it that states and localities 
are increasingly legislating on things. Why now? The answer um, is again a complex one. So on the one hand, there's been recent growth in immigration and the number of unauthorized immigrants, right? So there are 40.4 million immigrants in this country, and it's estimated that over 11 million of, of them are undocumented. Now, as the economy has struggled over the last uh, five years, they estimate that this number has gone down pretty substantially. Um, people who come here simply to be employed when employment doesn't exist leave, right? Um, but nonetheless, we have this both large immigrant population and large undocumented immigrant population. And immigrants tend to locate in large cities, which creates concentrated immigrant communities in only select locations. But at the same time, they've also increasingly located in non-traditional areas, you know, areas that are not accustomed to having immigrants. So when new immigrants show up in New York City, New York City is um, the sort of immigrant mecca. And there, there isn't a lot, a head doesn't really get turned when a new immigrant shows up. In contrast, when a new immigrant shows up in a small town in Louisiana, um, there is a lot of, uh, there, there can be a lot of conflict, a lot of misgivings, lack of trust, et cetera, right? Because the local community is not accustomed to having an immigrant population. And so to see this visually, um, we can begin to start our, our numeric literacy. And so we look at immigration in, into the United States over the last um, 140 years or so, 150 years. And we see on the first half of, of the diagram, um, our first wave of, of immigration, right? These are, for many of you, this might be when your ancestors immigrated into this country. These are largely European immigrants. Um, coming in through Ellis Island. And then by, but by the 1930s, this type of immigration has largely died off, okay? And so we have relatively low immigration in the middle part of the uh, 20th century. But as you look to the right side of the diagram, we see that really starting in the um, 80s, but particularly in the 2000s, or uh, 1990s and 2000s, we see, again, this tremendous growth in immigration, higher than we had in our first immigrant um, influx. And this has been really, really significant. All right, so to get at this concept of the concentration of immigration, we can see this map allows us to see um, where immigrants are, are concentrated. And so the darker the color, the more concentrated the immigrant population. So this is the percent of the population that is foreign born. And so you see the dark blue, these are areas um, where you have a really high proportion of, of people who are foreign born. And what we see is there are a lot of, of foreign born and traditionally immigrant communities. So obviously in California, we would expect a lot and in the border towns of Texas, this is not surprising. Um, Florida, you have a many, many Cubans and Puerto Ricans who are, well, Puerto Ricans aren't actually considered immigrants, so that's a bad example, but um, you have many Cubans who are coming in, people from the islands who come into Florida, South America. Um, up here, you have New York City, right? So you have these traditional centers, but what you also see are these other dark, uh, darker spots, right? So these are areas where we see increasing immigration in places that we didn't used to have it. And when we look at where state where immigration is growing the fastest, we see these are states that are not traditionally that we we, we had not traditionally seen this. Right? So we're talking about North Carolina and Tennessee, Georgia, um, the South just more generally, right? We're talking about Nevada, we're talking about um, uh, I'm sorry, we're talking about uh, states in the in the Midwest. So these are states that are just not traditionally immigrant centers. Um, and so this is this has this is a real issue, okay? So I'm sorry. I um I'm getting a little distracted. I apologize. Um so the yellow states, as I mentioned, are states where you have the largest immigration growth. 
Um, but these are not just large immigration growth, like, oh, you know, a new 25 people show up. No, this is 280% or higher in a 20-year time period. And so this is really, really a lot of growth. And this can make people uncomfortable. And so, so we see that one of the reasons is growth. Is growth and growth in areas that people are not accustomed to having immigrants. But I guess the, the question then becomes, well, why would growth actually spawn this new legislation? And the, the answer is that a limited number of communities bear the brunt of the cost of immigration, and particularly unauthorized immigrants. And because you have a lot of immigrants in a limited number of communities, they often become the scapegoats for society's problems, like crime. So, you know, maybe you have a rash of, of burglaries in an area that may or may not have anything to do with the immigrant population. But if the easy answer is to say, well, it was the immigrants who did it, it's because we had all of these immigrants are coming in, um, they become the scapegoat. They, they become the answer to all of the reasons that society isn't functioning the way it should, whether or not they're actually the cause of the problem or not. And because, because of their difference, because they are an other, right? They're different than the native citizens. They speak a different language. Perhaps their skin color is different. Perhaps their community norms are different. Um, many communities develop a sense of threat, right? They, they feel like their community, their norms, their values are being threatened by, by new immigrants. And, and so we begin to see the reason why states and localities might want legislation, right? They are bearing the brunt of the cost. They're getting most of these new immigrants. They feel threatened by them. But why, if the federal government is supposed to be regulating on, on immigration, are states and localities actually doing it? And the answer is that the government is often viewed as incompetent. So even though, um, we, even though the federal government has been talking about comprehensive immigration reform, it hasn't happened in the last decade or even almost the last two decades two and a half decades right not since the 1990s have we had immigration reform and yet we have seen in these last two and a half decades this tremendous growth and so the cities are and states are, are tired of waiting for the federal government to do something when they're the ones being affected and the states and localities have borne the cost of new immigrants right so what I mean by this is that states and localities are the ones who provide services for immigrants, right? They're the ones providing education and health care who are needing to accommodate new infrastructure for growing population size and expanding the police force to accommodate a growing population, etc. right? And these things can be expensive, particularly when communities feel like the new residents are not are not paying their share of those costs. And so in addition to this, the federal government has re has increasingly relied upon state and local law enforcement for interior immigration enforcement. And what this means is that the, um, the federal government has given authority to states and localities to enforce federal immigration law. Um, to, they've given, for example, they've made it possible for, um, for people to check the immigration status of, of those who are stopped on routine traffic investigations or when they're arrested on misdemeanor charges. Um, and they have, they've empowered state and local governments to enforce immigration law. But this, the most important thing is this perceived federal incompetence, right? So as I just mentioned, since the 1990s, Congress has talked about but has been unable to agree on policy. They have not been able to get comprehensive reform passed, and so many states and localities no longer trust the federal government to regulate immigration. At the same time, what we see is that the nation as a whole has received benefits. So 
on the whole, immigrants, including illegal immigrants, benefit the country, right? So they um, provide a low-wage workforce, they, and they create economic benefit. They increase the gross domestic product, um, and in many ways, they are complements to existing American workers. So even though we talk about, or there's a lot of talk about immigrants displacing American workers, oftentimes immigrants are filling jobs that are complementary to the jobs that Americans typically work, as opposed to displacing them. So on the whole, there are national benefits. In contrast, states and localities are often bearing the cost. So they have education and healthcare, infrastructure, crime, all these other services that have to be provided to immigrants. State and local tax revenue generated by unauthorized immigration does not offset the cost of these increased service provision. And so if you um, pay attention to the news, well, you know that states and localities are really in fiscal crisis and do not have enough, enough money to provide the goods and services that they have committed to providing or making huge budget cuts, let alone being able to provide for um, people who they perceive to be here illegally. And um, federal legislation has amplified state and local costs, um, for example, by making it so that uh, immigrants cannot receive, or uh, particularly undocumented immigrants cannot receive many of the welfare benefits. And the reality is whether you think that immigrants should receive those welfare benefits or not, as a nation, we do not allow people to go hungry. We don't allow them to go without health care. We don't allow them to go without housing. And so if we don't allow these things and the federal government doesn't provide them, that means that states and localities must provide them. And this is expensive. It's expensive and many states and localities feel like it shouldn't be their responsibility. And so what we come to is that many communities feel like this, right? This is a political cartoon. And so we, so there's this sense that the U.S., you know, we're doing things like building this fence, right? Keep out. We don't want you. We're going to put up a big sign. And yet we're going to help you figure out exactly how to get into the country. And once you're here, we're going to give you all of these free things, right? We're going to make it really easy for you once you get here. And so states and localities get angry, and they get angry to the point of feeling like they need to take action to pass legislation. So one of the ways that states and localities have tried to deal with immigration issues is through um, education policy, and in particular through state level in-state tuition. Um, so this is one, this policy has arisen in, at the federal level as well, and you might recognize it as the DREAM Act, um, but it's legislation that would allow the children of undocumented immigrants who grew up in the United States to receive in-state tuition. So in most states, these students are charged out-of-state tuition, um, but are not eligible for federal financial aid and frequently can't afford the cost of school without that financial aid. And so what it means is that even though they would like to go to school, they really can't afford to go to school. And so we have 16 states that have passed in-state tuition for undocumented youth. Um, in general, to qualify, students have to have attended a school in the state for a certain number of years. So um, typically like four or five years, they need to have graduated from high school in the state. They need to sign an affidavit saving, stating that they have either applied to legalize their status or will do so as soon as they're eligible, right? And so these are not, we're not talking about, um, you know, if you are a 18 year old immigrant and you cross the border, you can come and, and go to school for free. Or not, I'm sorry, for, not for free, but for in-state tuition. We're talking about people who grew up in the state, who went to school in the state, who many times consider themselves to be Americans. They may never rem ha remember having lived in a country other than the United States because they were brought here by their parents as children. And so these are the states that have passed in-state tuition. Um, even though they're different colors, all of the ones that have boxes around them have passed in-state tuition um, provisions. And we see that there are two different perspectives on whether or not we should pass state immigration. 
And so I'm going to show you uh, these two videos. So on the on this first one is from Fox News. Um, so this is going to be a much more conservative perspective. And as you might guess, this is making the case and a causal story for why we should not provide California or provide illegal immigrants with in-state tuition or the children of illegal immigrants with in-state tuition. Turning now to education in America this week, we're focusing on issues affecting our students and the education of our youth in our special series, Lifting Our Grade. Joining me now to talk about California's law that allows illegal immigrant students the right to pay in-state tuition prices, as well as the California Dream Act legislation, which if passed, would give state aid to illegal immigrant uh, students. Joining me now, Congressman Brian Bilbray of California. Congressman Bilbray, also the chairman of the House Immigration Reform Caucus. Congressman, great to have you with us, uh, and uh, we appreciate your time. The, the idea that California has been upheld in, in providing in-state tuition to illegal immigrant students, that's subtle law now, but the DREAM Act is something else altogether in which state taxpayer money would be going to not citizens of the state, but rather illegal immigrant students. Is that correct? Yes. It, yeah, and, and at a time when they're, they're cranking up the expenses to those um, citizens and to legal residents and saying, well, we can't afford not to raise your, your fees. And at the same time that there has been historically in the last few years, um, literally a blockage of, of transfers from the junior colleges into the four-year institutions because there's no room. So what you have now is you have a, a school system that says we really don't have enough room for everybody. Uh, we don't have enough money to go around, but we're going to accommodate, not only accommodate the illegal um, students, we're going to give them, give them a cut rate price. And it, it's your contention then that, uh, that effectively illegal immigrants are responsible to what degree in crowding out citizen students? Look, look if there's one student that didn't get in. My daughter could not transfer into the UC system, and so she was forced to have to pay a private Catholic school to get to finish her degree. That one student, my daughter, was enough to where this should not be allowed, should not be um, encouraged, and the federal government should be drawing some big lines. And I think we should be looking seriously at the fact that if California has so much money that they can sit there and subsidize illegal students and train them to, to have a job that is illegal in the United States, then maybe the federal government ought to think about um, trust those funds should go to a state that doesn't need, that, that needs the money more. Because obviously California acts like it's got enough money to not only um, throw around, but to give, give to people who are illegally here and give preference. And Lou, let me tell you something. This mm -hmm. is the, the, the terrible uh, slippery slope you go down because yeah. what happened when our family was, we were told that we have to show more identification to get into school than somebody they might thought, thought was illegal. They're profiling in reverse and actually saying under their profiling that if they think you're a U.S. citizen, you've got to show more identification than if they think you're illegal in the country. That's how bad it's getting in California. I'm and California, we should point out, is uh, the deficit right now, the budget deficit is, what, $9 billion, I believe, uh, and, and, and the budget that had been passed by the, the, uh, the legislature has just been vetoed by Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, matters only get worse. Uh, they, what do you think should be done, then, in the state of California, other states that are facing similar circumstances? I think it's about time the average citizen says, look, I don't care how many lobbyists for the illegals you have in, the, in Sacramento. I don't care how many pressure groups that are they're twisting your arm. You're supposed to be electing the citizens of the, of the state, not kowtowing to the, the pressure groups who are, who are trying to get you to represent the illegals in the state rather than the citizens that you're sworn to represent. And so I think that the biggest issue is that people have just got to start holding these elected officials accountable. When you sit there and say, we're going to accommodate people that are breaking the law, but we're not going to f have room for those who are playing by the rules. It's like, how much more can they, they cross the line of reason and common decency? Okay, so whether or not you agree with that perspective, this is the causal story on the on the side that says, look, we shouldn't support tuition for for undocumented, in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants. And this argument is that these people are here illegally, 
they shouldn't receive benefits, they shouldn't receive um, positions that legal people would otherwise have. You know, this is this is an inappropriate use of our resources, and they're breaking the law, right? So it puts the blame for those those immigrants uh, squarely on the shoulders of the illegal immigrant themselves, right? It's a very much an individual blame. And it says that the state should not provide resources for those immigrants. This is um, a, a different perspective. So this is a testimony um, of Ola Caso. Um, she's a Michigan resident who is testifying to Congress through the Judiciary Committee um, about the DREAM Act that was considered in the federal government. Okay, so she is an immigrant. She'll tell her story um, about, and this is, this is the sort of causal story about why we should grant in-state tuition. Okay, um, so the video is really bad. Um, the sound and the picture are off, um, but really all you need to do is to be able to hear her, and so um, you'll just have to ignore the fact that they are poorly timed. Uh, Chairman Durbin and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to submit this testimony. I was five years old, but I remember like it was yesterday. Apprehensively, I teetered into the perplexing classroom. Students spoke in a language completely foreign to me. The teacher too spoke and pointed a certain direction. What did she want me to do? Where did she want me to go? I stood there frozen still and silent like a statue. The children stared and they laughed. After a week of my unremitting silence, I was directed to the principal's office. My mother was there too, seated to the right of the translator that helped her enroll me into school. The teacher spoke and the translator began speaking too. She says Ola might need special attention. She barely socializes with the other kids and she's not learning anything. She suggests that Ola be taken out of the general class and be placed into the ELL program so she can get the extra assistance she needs. I've come a long way since that day, 13 years ago. I've become proficient in the English language and I've excelled in my studies. Since the third grade, I've been placed in advanced programs, all of which I fully utilized. I have taken every advanced placement course my high school's offered, and I've earned a 4.4 GPA doing so. I earned a 30 on my ACT, with English being my highest score. In high school, I was a varsity athlete. I ran cross country in the fall, and I played tennis in the spring. I was treasurer of student council, and I was treasurer of the National Honor Society. Furthermore, I tutor students that are still struggling to become proficient in English, and I've received numerous scholarship offers, and I've been accepted to several universities. I commit countless hours to community service and charity events because I feel that big change comes through little steps. I juggle all my schoolwork, after school activities, and community service projects while also having a job. I have completely immersed myself within the American culture, of which I so strongly desire to become a citizen. I am currently enrolled in the University of Michigan, one of the most prestigious public universities in the nation, where this fall I will be majoring in brain, behavioral, and cognitive science with a concentration in pre-med. I ultimately aspire to become a surgical oncologist, but more importantly, despite seemingly endless obstacles, I intend to work for patients that cannot afford the astronomical fees accompanying life-saving surgeries, patients that are denied the medical treatment that they deserve. My goal is not to increase my bank account. My goal is to decrease the amount of preventable deaths. How can I go to a lucrative job every day knowing that there are mothers wasting away in front of their children because they cannot afford a surgery? I cannot, and I will not. I wish to remain in this country to make a difference. I wish to remain in this country to help American citizens. On March 28th, I was spontaneously told that I would be deported in less than a week, despite the fact that my family has complied with all immigration laws for the last 13 years. I was two months short of obtaining my high school diploma. I was shocked. How could I be sent to a place that I didn't even remember, a culture that is completely foreign to me? I'm not even fluent in Albanian, so if I were to be sent back, I cannot pursue a college education. My hard work, my dreams, and my future were at risk of being eradicated. I have considered one country, and one country only, to be my home. America is my home, not Albania. My community rallied behind me. They asked for my deportation to be suspended, and the Department of Homeland Security responded and granted me deferred action for one year so I can continue my studies. My family came here legally, and we followed the law every step of the way. Despite my compliance with the law, there is no way I can obtain citizenship under the current law. Despite all my hard work and contributions, I face removal from the only country I've ever considered home. Despite my aspirations and good intentions for my country, I face deportation in less than a year. I am a DREAM Act student. I was brought to this country when I was five years old. 
I grew up here. I am an American at heart. There are thousands of other dreamers just like me. Look around the room and you will see hundreds of them today. All we are asking for is a chance to contribute to the country that we love. Please support the DREAM Act. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of all the dreamers. Ola, thank you. You were speaking for thousands. All right, and so what you see in this testimony, I mean, is is the real causal story for supporting an in-state tuition. And in this case, um, the federal Dream Act also had a had a had a citizenship component to it, and um, that at the state level we're not talking about. But the the causal argument is the same, right? And that is that those people who those the children of illegal immigrants didn't have a choice about whether they to come or not. They did not commit a criminal act, right? They were brought here as children. They're Americans in their culture and in their in their dreams or goals or aspirations. They often have been very successful in our community. They want to com they want to contribute to American society in positive ways, um, and that they should be given access to an education to do that. Not least of which, because we know that college education improves our ch improves people's chances of having good paying jobs and, and of being able to be a productive citizen in our country. Um, but the, and in this case, the causal story, the problem definition, right? So in the, in the other, the problem was being defined as an issue of illegal immigrants, people who are criminals trying to gain access to privileges that they don't, they don't have the right to, okay? In this case, the problem definition is really focused around um, the fact that people who are essentially American in every way except for the legal one and who were innocent victims um, in terms of being brought here, uh, that they do not have access to the, to the things that will help them to be successful and help them to be productive American citizens. Okay. And so we see these two different um, causal stories play out at the state level all over the place. And so this time, or this for this lecture, you have a reading that looks at these two different, at two different states who are thinking about passing in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants, Kansas and Arkansas. And so in Kansas, the in-state tuition passed and it has now been implemented. In Arkansas, it failed. And what this case really highlights is how a causal story, how a problem definition can fundamentally alter not just the policy outcome, but the policies that are considered to begin with. And so um, what you will read is that in Kansas, the problem was defined as whether or not to allow in-state tuition. In Arkansas, it, it began as this question, right, whether or not to allow in-state tuition. But in the face of a lot of competing opinions, what it ended up becoming about was whether or not the state had the authority to grant in-state tuition to begin with. All right, and what that meant is in that transition, the problem definition transitioned the available options. Because on the Kansas side, the question is whether, whether or not to allow this in-state tuition. And so those causal stories that we just watched are what came into play. Are these criminals trying to gain access to privileges they don't deserve? Or are these innocent, um, children who deserve to have access to mm -hmm. the resources that will help them be successful, right? So two competing causal stories in Kansas. In Arkansas, it started with those two competing causal stories, but what it ended up being was a question about federal, about deferring to federal, the federal authority, right? It became about um, the problem became about whether the state had the authority and the decision came down to, no, you know, we don't have the federal authority. Um, I, you need to be able to read this, but this should give you a, a framework for understanding those two sort of, sort of sides. And as you be, as you read it, if you haven't already, um, these are the questions that I want you to think about and try to identify. And these should help you be able to make those connections about applying a causal story to policy areas generally, as well as to the specific causal story or policy area. So I want you to think about what the problem is in each state. 
So we, I just gave you a sort of rough explanation of what the problem is, but think about that in more depth. Who's involved in the problem identification in each state? And how might those people um, influence the way that pr the problem is defined and the causal story that develops, right? Because in all of these things, policy is a political process, right? Policy helps create politics and politics help create policy. And so who is involved makes a big difference. So think about in those two different um, cases, who's involved and how that influences things. Um, think about what the dominant causal story is. Again, I gave you a sort of broad stroke, but what are the nuances of those causal stories? I want you also to think about beyond the reading, what types of causal stories you have heard about immigration and undocumented immigrants. How are they similar or different from those that are presented in the reading. Again, this will help you um, be able to apply these concepts to your the policy area that you have researched as well as to be successful on the unit assessment. Um, you know what the policy choice was, I covered that, but um, there is a little more nuance in the reading, so think about that. How the policy choice is linked to the causal story. And so we talked about how that problem definition and causal story constrains the existing policy options. And so I want you to really look for evidence of that in that reading. And finally, how might the policy choice differ if there was a different causal story? This is very important because as we talked about in our last lecture, um, causal stories are not static. And there's a lot of incentive to try and alter the causal story, the dominant causal story. So how, the, how might a different causal story affect the policy? Think about that. And finally, I want you to think about who benefits and who is harmed by each, each state's policy choices. Because the reality is, is that in every policy, there are winners and there are losers. And the, the goal of policy in a democratic system is that one group is not always the winner and one group is not always the loser, but that the winning and losing is dispersed across policies. So I want you to think about who is the winner and who is the loser in these stories. I want to remind you about the requirements for this week. As you have, as we've already talked about two times, um, you have your readings, your lectures, make sure you do your pre-class survey, your plagiarism test, and your discussion posts, and then make sure that you respond by Sunday to your discussion partner. Looking ahead, I want to uh, just sort of let you be aware. So next week, we're going to talk about the social construction of target populations, which is in many ways an extension of this concept of a causal story. Um, the reading for next week, or for the social construction, is an academic article. It's pretty dense, but we're going to cover it in more detail than we covered this week's readings, um, because it's it can be a little bit challenging to read. And so I want you to just do your best on it. Um, and of course, if you have questions, please email me. We're also going to talk about security, needs, values, and norms. And the case that we're going to look at to evaluate these sorts of things is the U.S. Patriot Act. And for next week, you have two assignments. You have the discussion and response posts, and then you have your first unit assessment. So make sure that you are keeping up on the lectures and reading, because all of these things come very quickly. Um, if, you, if we were in a conventional class after the, at the end of two weeks, in this class is the equivalent of six weeks in a different class or in a conventional class. So um, I know it's quick, but um, we're just going to have to do the best we can with this constrained time limit. So I hope that you are all well, um, that you have a great rest of your week. And um, again, if you have any questions or you'd like to have office hours with me, please email me. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.